Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Gabriel Kelly, and on behalf of the Amazing Thinkers team, I welcome you here tonight to the final lecture of Adelaide's 24th Thinker in Residence, Dr. Martin Seligman. May I say that I know the traffic's bad, so we started a few moments late, and we know that people will be coming in, so please let's just be patient. We meet tonight on Ghana land, and we acknowledge the spiritual beliefs of the Ghana people, and we honour the elders past and present. I have a number of welcomes I'd like to go through with you. Welcome to Premier Jay Weatherall, to Martin Seligman and Mandy Seligman, to Minister Rankin, who will be arriving shortly, I believe, to Miss Amy Walker and Miss Rob Reberley from the University of Pennsylvania, Miss Rachel Sanderson, MP, Mr Raymond Spencer, Chair of the Economic Development Board and of the South Australian Health and Medical Research Centre, Mr Steve Wesseling, Chief Executive of the South Australian Health and Medical Research Centre, Welcome to local government mayors, and I know there are a few here, leaders of government agencies and business, principals of state schools, Catholic schools and independent schools, university leaders, and distinguished guests all. I particularly want to acknowledge our partners in the residency, and I believe we have a slide explaining who our partners are. They have been really incredible, and we would not have been able to run this residency without the support of this stellar group of partners. Particular thanks goes to our lead partner, the Department for Education and Child Development, Keith Bartley in particular and David Rathman, and Simon Murray and Matthew White from St Peter's College, Adelaide, and South Australian Health's David Swan and Mark Diamond. Without the early support of these three leading partners, this residency wouldn't have come to pass. So thank you so much for your inspiration and leadership. Their organisations were the first to get on board and we appreciate it. May I say too that all of the other partners we greatly appreciate, all of the three systems of education, state, Catholic and independent schools, and of course our universities. Welcome too to our interstate visitors, Professor Field Ricard from the University of Melbourne, uh, Mr Charlie Scudamore, the Deputy Principal of Geelong Grammar School, and the Chief Executive of Victoria Health, Gerald Rector. I'd like to personally thank Mr Bob Ford too, the Chairman of the Entertainment Centre and the staff of the Entertainment Centre for the support tonight, and also Peter Hurley and the Australian Hotels Association SA branch and the Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Union for all of your support for this great work that we're doing here in South Australia. Now I also know that many of you came, some of you in cars still coming in the door, but many of you came in large groups and some of you came in buses. We've got people and executives from companies, hundreds of educators from the state, Catholic and independent schools. We have groups of health workers and community surf service providers from all over the state. We know and we hope that if a group from a school or an organisation come together, then the chances that this will bloom into committed action is high. These are the stakes in an event like this. I'd particularly like to welcome parents here tonight, parents of young children. You were the inspiration for this residency from the very beginning. From the beginning, we in our office were animated by this vision that large numbers of parents would be exposed to Dr Seligman's wellbeing science and that that would introduce some new ideas into families that would help them build a resilient future and a satisfying life for the whole family. Now in the Thinkers program, we move a better future forward faster. We introduced the ideas of Professor Fraser Mustard and the new knowledge about neuroscience of young children into South Australia. We changed our approach to housing long-term homeless through the inspiration of Roseanne Haggerty, and we've re-energised and re-inspired our approach to advanced manufacturing through the leadership of Professor Joran Roos. Now, this residency, like most of them, has been more than two years in the making. It emerged in response to the fact that one in four, that there was evidence that one in four young people suffer from mental illness and that the new science of positive psychology seemed to provide some protective capacity against mental illness in the young, and we were really interested in that. We talked very early on to Geelong Grammar, early adopters of positive psychology in schools, and we looked at what they were doing and found it to be very inspiring. There were also issues that were raised to us in the program about stress and malaise in the workforce, to which positive psychology in organisations also seemed to have some answers. We began talking to Dr Seligman and raising the investment required. Together, we launched our normal thinkers process of engagement across the state. The residency supported the meticulous evidence-based wellbeing work at St Peter's College, Adelaide, and the focus on positive psychology in the community led by Mount Barker High School. We brought Penn Resiliency Training to Adelaide and we began to pilot wellbeing measurement of young people and teachers. 
But the challenge of creating a residency aiming to build well-being in the population, to improve the mental toughness of the population and to reduce mental illness is a complex challenge. We realised early on that this work would involve inviting large numbers of South Australians to consider a new way of looking at things. You simply can't make a policy for everyone to improve their well-being. People have to want to do it themselves, like wearing sunscreen or eating well or exercising. So we knew we'd need to invite a change in our culture, in schools, in organisations or in families, if we were to achieve the result of decreasing mental illness of young people or improving the resilience and optimism of people at work in numbers that were large enough to count. So we decided to put Dr Seligman in front of as many people as possible. In all, by the end of March, Dr Seligman will have presented directly to over 9,000 South Australians. By the way, this lecture booked out in five days and the first 1,400 seats went in 30 hours. So I thank you so much for your enthusiasm and I really am delighted that every one of you is here tonight. We've reached out to educators, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, carers, mental health workers, parents, students, organisations and the general public in a wide range of events and you might have seen some of them described uh, before the event began today. Over and over again, South Australians have voted with their feet and told us that they're interested in this subject. Together, we're seeking the answer to these questions. Can we reduce the number of young people who are vulnerable to mental illness? How can we protect ourselves, our children, our families and our communities against mental illness? What would it look like if we, if you, were at your best in your life? How would we be here in South Australia if we were all flourishing? These are the questions of this residency. I'd now like to introduce you to some of the people who've been involved in this work with us by video. Following that, I'll invite Honourable Jay Weatherall to the stage and we will then hear from Dr Martin Seligman. And if there's time, we'll have some Q&A, but it will be de depend on the length of Dr Seligman's speech. If we could go to the video, thank you. When the kids come into my classroom, um, I guess that's why I'm teaching the whole person. And as soon as they t step in the door, if you just assume um, the best of them and, and, and go from there, then it always works. We have adopted the M Professor Martin Seligman's framework of PERMA. And we talk about each of those qualities and I, we teach them explicitly. It's as simple as just smiling at them when they walk in. Yes, you've got new shoes. It's, it's building that relationship. And many of them come through the door and they're so excited about things that they achieve along the way. A really exciting part about it is the buzz that's happening in the school. Uh, the staff and, have now are talking collectively about Martin and his work and positive education and how to positively engage our students back into their curriculum. I'm a tough old hard thing and two of them just made me cry when I read them. I was probably just looking at them. Uh, just because they had this, they demonstrate these sort of hidden depths or this positive element that I just hadn't seen before in these particular kids. And so when I think of a positive institution, I'm mindful of you know, what's the experience of children or adults within it. And work that is done in early childhood and middle childhood and adolescence and so forth flows through to certain behavioural patterns and aptitudes uh, later in life. I've had some really wonderful success with just close relationships with boys that will now sit down and talk to me about issues in a very frank and candid way and they will say, oh, I'm doing such and such again. And if we uh, inoculate the population or starting with uh, school children to be uh, sort of fluid and capable in applying these skills, there is a valid expectation and it seems to be supported by the evidence so far that in later life people don't uh, flow through to mental health services or uh, uh, the correctional services. So I know that if we can get well-being right for our children, we can get learning right for them. You know, we all walked taller, feel better when we've had a positive experience. And that, that you know, that flow-on effect, um, yeah, and, and hopefully there are some cats that aren't being kicked as a result. We have very few rules now at our school. We work on common sense and we work on positivity. Previously we'd have trouble getting him to even go into school. Well, since we've been here he's, he's running into school like he just absolutely loves it. He even does homework at home. 
He would never do that before. Now it's time for and I'm okay with stuff. That's right, you f he finds all the positive things. I felt proud of myself. Yeah, I feel privileged. It made me feel like I was good at something. I feel pretty special actually, because it's just nice, because the whole group, we all get along. When people come and ask me about the weather, I feel really good because um, I don't have many other things that people I get noticed for. Teachers and stuff um, care, like if I talk to them about the weather, they don't just walk off, they listen to me. And it's just a really good school to be at and it's just, yeah, fun. When using the 24 character strengths to analyse the characters in our English literature, I, f I found that our view of these characters' personalities has changed from a 2D to a 3D perspective now we can go into a depth which is far more sufficient in analysing the different parts of their psychology. You can be as you want, you can be positive and they will help you get to that stage. And There's nothing like being in class and having a teacher tell you, oh, yeah, your work is excellent, you know. It makes me feel like I could be more than I am. It's, it's like all my problems aren't there anymore. Being there for people, that's what makes me feel good, mainly. So I think that's the most important thing you can do with kids. Let them know that you like them and that you're going to forgive them and that everything's going to be okay. Invite uh, Honourable Jay Weatherall, Premier of South Australia, to the stage to make a few comments and then introduce Dr Martin Seligman. Well, thank you, Gabrielle, um, to my Cabinet and Parliamentary colleagues, uh, to uh, Raymond Spencer, Chair of the Economic Development Board, uh, distinguished guests, in particular Professor Seligman, uh, your wife Mandy, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, well, um, making sure that every citizen can flourish and be the very best they can be, and uh, having a community where we maximise the well-being of that community. Uh, I can't imagine a better description of, of what my job should be. And to think that there's been somebody out there uh, who's spent his professional life actually dreaming about these things and thinking about the ideas that promote those things was a wonderful revelation to me. And to think that we could attract him here to be a thinker in residence to assist us in these two endeavours is very exciting. And it's my great privilege to be standing here uh, to introduce uh, Professor Seligman as he gives this lecture. I don't know whether it's because uh, this is an idea that's uh, perhaps um, found a time in history uh, that is particularly poignant. Um, it seems to me these ideas were always good ideas. I don't know why they seem so exciting now, but um, they do seem very exciting right now at this point in history, um, at a time when perhaps there's a lot of negativity about um, the idea that somebody seeks to turn on its head the question and say, um, how do we confront problems and difficulties that people are facing and instead turn that on their, its head and say, how do we celebrate the strengths and positive elements of somebody in the successful life that they're leading and using that strong place to then go back and answer some of these other questions about the difficulties that they find in their life. To actually then translate that um, on the broader level to our community and to rather think of the, the difficulties and challenges we face and rather think of the strengths of our community and reason from that back to solve some of the things that we might regard as challenges just seems to me to be an incredibly liberating philosophy. And uh, I find it very attractive uh, and I think many of the people who've listened to you find it inspiring and attractive. Um, I think that uh, this residency really could be a, a watershed in the way in which we think about not only ourselves as individuals but also as ourselves as a community and perhaps even as a state. Uh, and um, I know that everybody that's been touched by your residency, Professor Seligman, has been enriched by it. 
On the last occasion, I know that you challenged us to give uh, some thought uh, to the way in which we could measure well-being, uh, understanding that what gets measured gets done generally. So this is a very powerful idea and we have been working away at that. You've also asked us to think about early childhood, which is a particular passion of mine. And uh, your residency, I think, uh, offers us the opportunity to do something very powerful. I think you call it psychological immunisation, but the notion uh, of actually preparing our youngest children uh, for all of the ups and downs of life to be resilient to the things that will be in their way, to allow them to conquer them, seems to me like the best possible preparation we could provide for our citizens. And I'm sure it will lift uh, the general level of capability and happiness of South Australians if we're able to unlock that challenge that you've put in front of us. Thank you so much for coming and being part of the South Australian community. Um, you're here now uh, on the second of your phases in this residency. Uh, I'm confident um, that uh, you will again inspire us as you have on the occasions you've spoke to us before. Would you please join me all in welcoming Professor Martin Seligman to the microphone. Thank you. Thanks for <laughs> Uh, through most of human history, life has been a veil of tears. And your premier asks, why now positive psychology? So when nations are poor and at war and in famine and in plague and in social disharmony, it's perfectly natural that their science, their art, their thoughts should be about defense and damage. When nations are wealthy and at peace, not in plague, not in famine, not in poverty, their thoughts soar elsewhere. And that's my topic tonight. What I want to do is um, to ask n n no less a question than what is the most you can hope for in life? What, what is the most you can hope for for the future of your children? What, what is the most you can hope for for the future of your nation? And it's not uh, obvious what that answer is. Historically, that answer has been the most government can do, the most human being can do in life, this is what Freud and Schopenhauer told us, was to not to suffer, to hold our misery to zero. And I'm gonna to suggest to you that that notion is empirically false, it's morally insidious, and it's politically bankrupt. And um, that, that's my theme tonight. And I've had the uh, extraordinary experience of living for two months in Adelaide, being thinker in residence, and, and my job tonight is to talk about the progress that's been made about well-being, but I have a bigger job, and that's um, to present a, a vision for our future, a vision in which Adelaide and South Australia could be central in the world. Um, it's been an extraordinary experience, and I, and I uh, must thank several of the people who have been so instrumental. Uh, Gabe Kelly has led this throughout, and uh, with Ann Rose and with the whole Thinkers team. Uh, my staff, Amy Walker and Reb Rebelly, have been here throughout the period at my right hand. Uh, uh, Matthew White and Simon Murray at Saints, uh, I think, are uh, the center of what we're doing. And then in Mount Barker, Warren Simons and David Garrett and, and the mayor, Annie Ferguson have been at the center of what we're doing, and I'll talk about their work. And uh, I, I'm happy to say I've had the privilege of spending now many hours with your premier. Uh, I think we have the same vision, and for me, uh, it's a dream, dream come true, and I'll tell you 
about the dream in just a bit. Uh, here's the outline of what I'm going to do in the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, it's really why well-being, what well-being is, and how to build well-being, and then what is the future of well-being for yourselves. And I'm going to ask you to think, I, in, 2,000 of you are here, and, and you must be thinking, what's in it for me? If, if well-being were to become a central policy in South Australia, a central policy in your own life, what's in it for you? And I essentially want to talk about that. So, um, I'm going to talk about my recommendations. Uh, there are three of them, and they'll evolve and talk. One is to measure well-being throughout South Australia. The second is to build well-being throughout South Australia. And then I have a big recommendation, number three, and I'll hold that till the very end. Uh, to do that, uh, it involves saying why we should care about well-being. And I began by saying that. And I think uh, when a nation is doing well, when people are doing well, it turns out there's more to life than just holding suffering to zero. By the way, I'm all for uh, the minimization of suffering. I've spent 35 years of my life working on post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, suicide, uh, and the like. But there's something more, and that's what's captured in the notion of well-being. Uh, to, if I had said 30 years ago to you that uh, it's a good idea in your life, in your corporation, in your nation to build well-being, I think you, you would have appropriately not taken it seriously. And that's because we didn't know how to measure well-being. We didn't know how to build it. Well, in 30 years, it turns out we can now measure it. And I'll talk about uh, the measurement of uh, well-being and what it is. I'm going to argue there are five elements to well-being, each of which is measurable. Uh, the first is what you normally think of as happiness, uh, felt positive emotion. Uh, the second is engagement, being completely wrapped up with the people you love at work in your leisure. The third is good relationships. Uh, the fourth is meaning and purpose in life. And the fifth is accomplishment. And the reason for this list is I've asked myself, what are the elements that free people, unoppressed, choose to do? I believe these are the five elements that we're, we positively choose to do. And then, given that definition of well-being, uh, I want to talk about its measurement, and uh, its measurement in schools. And as I talk about this, I'll talk about progress in South Australia uh, on the measurement of well-being. Uh, then I'll ask the question, can you build well-being? And I should say that it's not, it wasn't obvious, um, Having spent so much of my life working on misery, um, people ask me, why didn't I work on happiness? And the reason was a study done in the 1970s of 14 lottery winners. And uh, Phil Brickman followed them through winning the lottery. You win the lottery, you become very happy. But three months later, they're all back down to the curmudgeonly level they were at before winning the lottery. So I thought well-being, happiness, was like dieting. That is, any of you, uh, dieting is a scam. Uh, any of you can lose 5% of your body weight in about three weeks by following any diet on the bestseller list. I did the watermelon diet. I lost 20 pounds in three weeks. I had diarrhea for three weeks. <laughs> uh, and so the important question about well-being is it just something you can kind of boost and then it goes back to where it belongs or can it be lastingly increased? And it turns out for positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment, these can be lasting, lastingly increased. And that's the main discovery of positive psychology over the last 15 years. And then I want to talk about what's going on in South Australia, uh, progress in building well-being. Uh, and finally, I want to talk about the politics of well-being. Uh, the notion that prosperity is not just GDP, 
that the reason we care about GDP, the reason we care about sustainability, is because there is a further basic bottom line, and that is the well-being of citizens. So I want to talk about the politics of this, and then present a vision uh, for South Australia. Uh, so that's what I want to do in the 40 minutes that remains. Um, why well-being? Um, I've been a therapist most of my life, and what I was taught as a therapist was that if I did really good work and I got rid of all of her sadness, helped to get rid of all of her anxiety, helped to get rid of all of her anger, that I'd get a happy person. And I never, never did, even when those three things went away. What I got was an empty person. And that's because the skills of the positive side of life, the PERMA skills, positive emotion, good relationships, accomplishment and meaning, are completely different from getting rid of the dysphorias. The dysphorias get in the way, but it is very important to know that you can be depressed, you can be highly anxious, you can have cancer, and you can have high well-being. Very important. It's uh, every human being's birthright, uh, and it's buildable. Um, it's very important for the 35 minutes that remains to realize that what I'm saying is that well-being is more than the absence of ill-being. I'm all for getting rid of ill-being, but it's not remotely enough. And when we ask the question, what can we most hope for in life, it's not just getting rid of what's wrong. That doesn't remotely give us what's right. And what I'm trying to articulate is what, what counts as what's right in a human life. And I'm arguing that PERMA is a first approximation of that. Um, so what's in it for you? Let, let's say the vision I'm going to articulate uh, were to come about and that as an individual level in marriages, in the schools, in public policy, what we cared about was well-being. But what would happen to you, to your children? Well, there's a, about 1,500 articles now in the scientific literature on that, and we can make a guess. You would have more PERMA, statistically, more positive emotion, more engagement, better relationships, more meaning, and more accomplishment. Uh, you would likely have less depression. You'd likely have less anxiety in your life and in the lives of your kids. Uh, you would likely have better relationships. Turns out there are skills, I'll talk about one of them, of better relationships. Uh, you would likely have higher achievement, and I'll show you some of the evidence on that. Uh, it is quite possible that your children will go on to more success in life. In general, we've found not only that uh, uh, when you're successful in life, your well-being increases, but we follow people who have high well-being at age 18 the next 15 years, and we find that the upper 10% of people on well-being holding statistically constant their parents' income and their grades in college, uh, 15 years later earning about $15,000 a year more than the rest of the population. And, and this is something that uh, uh, I work on intensively and I'm not going to be able to talk about tonight, people who have high PERMA live longer. They have better physical health. The health care expenditure is less, holding everything else constant. So that's what's in it for you were this uh, uh, vision to come about. And so it remains to say what the vision is. So for me, what is well-being? It's importantly, this is a dashboard up there. Uh, there is no one number that tells you how well an airplane is doing. There's a dashboard of indicators, and depending on your mission, uh, how low the fuel is, the altimeter, the wind, uh, the speed matters. And human life, flourishing, is similar. There's a dashboard of indicators. There's no one number that tells you how well a person, a corporation, or a nation is doing. And the five elements are positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. And importantly, 
Each of these is now measurable. Um, we can now measure positive emotion, meaning in life, about as well as we can measure schizophrenia, depression, alcoholism. And importantly, Phil Brickman was wrong. You can have more of these things than you do now. You can actually have more positive emotion than you do now. You can have more engagement in life. You can have better relationships. You can have more meaning and purpose in life. And that's my story today. So let's talk about measurement. So um, this is uh, 40,000 adults from the European Union, uh, about 20 European Union nations. Uh, and they're measured by self-report of PERMA, by questionnaire. And uh, look at the discrepancies there. At the very top, you've got the perennial nation that comes out on the top of almost all life satisfaction stuff, and that's Denmark. Almost 40% of Danish adults are flourishing by PERMA criteria. In the middle, you've got Brits and Germans, about 20% of adults flourishing. And then down at the bottom, you've got uh, the uh, former Soviet states down at the 10% level. What this tells you is that on a state, a national level, well-being is measurable in adults, and there are huge differences from nation to nation. And this will feed into what I want to say about South Australia in about 20 minutes. This is done by questionnaire. Um, I'm part of David Cameron's uh, statistical committee, and Mr. Cameron has decided to, that he will phone 300,000 Brits every three months and ask them four questions about well-being. And most importantly, he has said he will hold himself accountable for the success or failure of public policy by changes in well-being. Uh, that's all to the good. Uh, your premier is doing something similar. I'll tell you about it in a moment. Um, but I want to tell you about the future. There, if, if, if I ask you, Charlie, how happy are you today, which is one of the well-being questions, there are a lot of artifacts in that. There's a better way, it's coming down the pike, uh, uh, of measuring the well-being of the world in real time, and it turns out to be free. Um, we comb through, it turns out in English, there are about 45,000 words and phrases that are perma words and phrases, or anti-perma words and phrases, like happy, excited, bored, and the like. So we comb systematically through billions of words every day on Twitter and on Facebook, and we ask the question, to what extent is, are the well-being and the ill-being words deployed? We believe this is a, a, a closer measure to human well-being than questionnaires. And I'm going to shock you with the next slide. Uh, these are men versus women. Uh, it involves about 100,000 men and women. And what you're looking at here, uh, these are called word clouds. But the bigger the word, the top are female, the bottom are male. The bigger the word, the more it distinguishes males from females. So it turns out in the social media, what girls and women talk about is excited, shopping, love, so. And you can see what boys talk about and think about. Uh, I, this is not only to shock you, but uh, we actually look at all 45,000 PERMA and anti-PERMA words. And so if it turns out you in, institute a well-being program in Mount Barker, you can ask the question, does it succeed by looking at the de-identified anonymous Twitter and Facebook in Mount Barker? In Chile, when the miners were rescued, the well-being words go up in Chile, they stay flat in Argentina. This is the future of the field of measurement. Uh, so that's measuring it. Now the question is, how? Uh, how can you build it? Well, it turns out these things are teachable. And you can build more of the positive emotions than you have now. I'll just give you a little bit of the science of that and why it's important. Uh, Barbara Fredrickson goes into corporations 
and 60 American corporations, and she counts all the positive words and the negative words. And she looks at the ratio of positive to negative words and asks, can you predict the financial success of the corporation? And the answer is you can. When the ratio of positive to negative words is 2.9 to 1 or greater, those 20 corporations are flourishing economically. Between 1 to 1 and 2.9 to 1, they're stagnating. Below 1 to 1, they're going bankrupt. Um, don't take the 2.9 home to your marriage. Uh, my colleagues John and Julie Gottman lock couples in an apartment for a weekend and they measure every word that's said and they're interested in predicting divorce. So it turns out if your ratio is 2.9 to 1, you're headed for divorce. Uh, five, you need a ratio of over five positive things said to every negative things said to predict non-divorce. Uh, what's really going on here is we always have to give bad news to people. And the question is, how, how much positivity do we need to build up in order for people to hear us, not to dig in their heels, not to be defensive? Different for business and marriage, and uh, my teenage daughter Nikki uh, showed me it was different for teenage, I came home one night a couple of years ago and excitedly told the family about the low SADA ratio, went off to my computer, went to work, 11 in the evening, Nikki comes in, she's 17 years old, she wants me to drive her to a party. Thursday night, I shouted at her, that Nikki, go to bed, do your homework, Thursday night. And she said, Daddy, you've got a terrible low SADA ratio. And the issue is to raise a kid, to raise a child, a teenager. What is the right Losada ratio? So that's a sample of the science going on here. Um, secondly, engagement, signature strengths. Um, I'll do an exercise with you now. Um, close your eyes. Think about something you have to do at work once a week or more that you don't like doing. Okay, open your eyes. If you had taken the Signature Strengths test, I have a website, it's up there, it's free. All the major tests of uh, what I'm talking about tonight are on it. The, uh, the Signature Strengths test would tell you uh, what your highest strength is. Sense of humor, kindness, prudence, social intelligence. Your exercise would be take your highest strength and use that to do the thing you don't like doing at work next week. And so, for example, one, one, one woman I worked with was a beggar uh, at the supermarket. She put things in bags. She didn't like doing it. And uh, uh, her highest strength was social intelligence. So what she had to do was recraft bagging to use social intelligence more. And so she resolved that she would make the encounter with her the social highlight of every customer's uh, day. And notice she's going to fail in that almost all the time. But she put what was best inside of her on offer continually. And bags became lighter and she liked the job more. So the question for you is find out, go to the website, find out your highest strength, and ask how you can do the thing you don't like doing at work uh, using your highest strength. Six months later, statistically, you'll be less depressed and you'll be happier. Um, by the way, I'm very interested in post-traumatic growth. And as many of you know, I work with the entire United States Army. And we're interested in the question of who in terrible adversity like combat grows? And the answer we've been able to find out so far, by the way, post-traumatic growth means that uh, you go through a terrible experience like combat, divorce, death of a spouse, but a year later you are stronger by physical and psychological measures than you were. And a fair part of the population shows that. And we ask, what who 
particularly grows a year after awful trauma. And those are the five signature strengths we find that are the predictors of post-traumatic growth in large samples of people. Relationships, the R. Uh, something new under the sun here. Um, how many of you are psychologists out there? Okay, well, some of you do marital and sexual therapy. Uh, marital therapy is the worst form of therapy. Uh, people are lying to you. They're, they're lying to each other. And, you know, sometimes they unite in, they form an alliance to hate you. And then things actually go pretty well. Uh, when we used to teach marital therapy, what we would teach our students is how to teach a couple to fight better. Not to have the same damn argument every day in a different guise. So what we were trying to do was to change um, insufferable marriages into barely tolerable marriages. And that's not positive psychology. And a, gr a group of brilliant marital therapists uh, asked the question not how do you fight, but how do you celebrate together? So your spouse comes home from work, she's been promoted. What do you say to her? Well, it turns out there are four kinds of things you can say. Until I read the literature, what I said was, Mandy, congratulations, you deserve it. No effect. That's called passive constructive. I've uh, trained 13,000 American drill sergeants. Drill sergeants, when their spouse comes home, says, you know what tax bracket that's going to put us into? <laughs> uh, active destructive. Passive destructive is, uh, what's for dinner? Well, it turns out the uh, only thing that works is active constructive. And that's to go through a long script, which doesn't come naturally, you have to be authentic about it, in which you say, I've been reading the reports you wrote to the company, the one you wrote three months ago on the pension plan is the best fiscal report I've seen in my 25 years of business. Now, exactly where were you when you were promoted? And exactly what did your boss say? And why do you think you were really promoted? What strengths do you show? And how can you use those more with the kids and in the community? And it turns out when you learn this skill, love, commitment, and sexuality all become enhanced. Uh, so it turns out there's stuff you can learn. Uh, meaning and purpose, belonging to and serving something that you think is bigger than you are. And the kind of exercise we do that increases meaning and purpose is we have people first tell us their vision of a positive human future, and then write their obituary through their grandchildren's eyes. Uh, if they're depressed patients, we call it a life summary, not an obituary. Um, <laughs> about what you did to make that human future more likely to occur. You build meaning, and finally it turns out uh, you can build accomplishment. And the most important thing that I think has been found out in the accomplishment literature is uh, we now measure self-discipline and grit in young children and teenage kids. We know their IQs, and we want to predict how they're going to do through the rest of high school. And it comes up over and over again that self-discipline and grit uh, are about twice as important as IQ in predicting academic success. So that's where, what PERMA is about and the fact that it can be built. Um, so let me now turn to what's going on in South Australia along these lines uh, on the first recommendation, which is measuring the well-being of all South Australians. Um, the reason to do this, as Jay mentioned, if you don't measure the right thing, you don't do the right thing. So if your only measure is GDP, then all you're going to do is do things to enhance the economy. I'm all for that, but as I alluded to, I think the economy is in service of human well-being and not the other way around. Um, and so uh, 
in, in the interest of measuring the right thing, um, all my first recommendation and it's, uh, is that the well-being of children, every child in South Australia, be measured. Uh, the, uh, uh, there is now in the population statistics of South Australia, the measurement of well-being across the entire adult population. So part of the recommendation, and it is now happening, uh, is the measurement of well-being across all adults as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, there's the traditional way of measuring well-being, uh, and there are these new approaches like Facebook and uh, Twitter. Uh, but I want to mention the invisible hand. And uh, uh, I've spent uh, a lot of the last 10 years looking for what exercises increase human well-being. It turns out there are about 10 of them that we've been able to find that stand up against random assignment placebo controls. But it's very important that the building of well-being is a local matter. It's not something that Dr. Seligman can tell you how to do. So just imagine the following. Imagine you decided that in your marriage, your job as a husband or a wife was to increase the PERMA of your spouse. And imagine that you were measuring it. Well, you're going to think of the ways locally to increase her positive emotion, her engagement, increase the relationship, her meaning in life. And the reason this is an invisible hand argument, part of the rationale for uh, Prime Minister Cameron's initiative of me measuring well-being is he's going to publish the results. Now, let's imagine that cashiers at Boots earn the same amount of money as cashiers at Sainsbury, but the well-being of cashiers at Boots is higher, and it's published. And you're trying to decide where you're going to work as a cashier. Well, you're going to go to Boots, but Sainsbury is going to start to think of ways to increase the well-being of cashiers at Sainsbury, which is to say, once you decide that well-being is your goal, an invisible hand, Adam Smith's invisible hand, which holds for the free market, also holds for well-being. You're going to find ways in any competitive environment to increase it. And that actually is a great hope for how to do it. Well, importantly, well-being is now on its way to be measured uh, in South Australia building well-being in South Australia. Uh, two schools have decided they're going to be the hubs of this. The first to do it through Matthew White and Simon Murray was St. Peter's College in Adelaide. And uh, I'll just tell you about the data worldwide in schools that <clears throat> when you teach well-being in the ninth grade and then you measure the kids through graduation, what you find is that children who have had as part of their literature course in ninth grade, you read Lord of the Flies in ninth grade, if you're in the well-being groups on Friday, uh, you have 80 minutes on what's known about kindness. And the next Wednesday, your assignment is to do three kind things. And then we measure carefully, what do these kids look like over the next three years? And we find their social skills are higher, and they get better grades. So importantly in education, the finding is that when you do positive education and you teach young children not only about spelling and reading and writing, but also about kindness and gratitude and signature strengths, that uh, if all you cared about was academic achievement and standards, it turns out they do better. But in addition, what you find is that PERMA goes up as well. And so this is what's been happening at St. Peter's College in Adelaide. Let me just tell you a few of the things that uh, uh, they've been up to. Um, it's now part of the strategic direction of the entire school. They've measured the well-being, the PERMA, of all 1,200 students and staff. They've given extensive training to 150 
uh, staff. Uh, uh, my faculty uh, came to uh, Saints and trained uh, the in, their entire faculty in well-being. Uh, and uh, in 2012, they began to teach well-being explicitly to over 800 students from age four to age 15. Uh, and most importantly, uh, St. Peter's College is sharing this through South Australia. Uh, Simon Murray, the headmaster, has founded an organization called PISA, Positive Education Schools Association. Uh, Forty schools joined immediately, just Australian schools. I'll talk more about its implications. Um, Warren Simons at Mount Barker has been doing very similar stuff with one extremely important addition. Can the school, can the high school be the hub of well-being for a community? So they've begun to measure well-being in students, staff, and in parents. They're training educators and uh, health sector workers in well-being. They're doing this in nine primary schools and two independent schools, as well at Mount Barker itself. And the hope is that if the high school is the hub for the measurement and training of well-being, that the well-being of the whole community will increase. And I'll return to the promise of that in just a moment. Okay, I'm almost done. And this brings me to my big recommendation. Uh, it is that Adelaide become the capital city of well-being in the world. Can, when we think about icons for a city, we think about the Opera House at Sydney. I'm suggesting that an idea can be the icon for a city and that Adelaide has an edge right now. And I want to tell you about the edge, but let me set this up by talking about um, what uh, Charlie Scudamore calls the well-being uh, tsunami. So uh, this is something that I've been watching for several years, and it's not, when Jay asked the question, why well-being now, and I tried to say it had something to do with abundance, with what Florence had in the uh, 15th century, uh, it turns out there are major well-being developments in many fields. Uh, in psychology, you just heard about some of them. Uh, uh, positive psychology courses are the most popular courses in the United States now. Uh, in economics, uh, I found myself, I don't know any economics, but I found myself keynoting a, a gathering uh, put together by three Nobel laureates in economics, and the question was, what is a good economy? That is, traditional economics has been about scarcity and the allocation of scarce resources. When we live in abundance, what does a good economy look like? So economists are interested in this. Uh, corporations uh, in several parts of the world uh, want to change the bottom line from being not just about profit, but being about PERMA as well. And the argument is, if you can bring PERMA to the employees and the customers of a corporation, the traditional bottom line follows. Uh, in sports, um, I got an a email from the West Point football team last week. And uh, here's what the coach, that it was headlined, the last 12 years in a row, Navy has beaten Army. And uh, the headline of my email was, Army beats Navy December 2013 by positive psychology. So it turns out the West Point football team, and the Army has invested now $140 million in the teaching of well-being for American soldiers, is now giving intensive PERMA training to its football team. Now, I have no idea whether or not this will work, but there is a literature in swimming, the NBA, and Major League Baseball, which basically shows that high PERMA athletes come back from defeat much better than low PERMA athletes. This is going on in sports. It's 
going on in politics. What uh, your premier and I have been talking about has been the question, is the bottom line of public policy GDP, or is it the well-being of citizens? And so the notion that the way we judge the success or failure of a government is not by military conquest or GDP, but by the well-being of its citizens is now a foot in politics. In biology, um, I'm part of a group that uh, funds positive neuroscience. We're interested in the question, what goes on in the brain during PERMA? What goes on in little kids during PERMA? Uh, and that's the neuroscience end. On the evolutionary end, there are uh, substantial biologists who believe in group selection, who believe that human beings are not selfish gene creatures, as Richard Dawkins has told us, but rather have been selected for love, compassion, teamwork, and virtue. Uh, and there are very live questions about whether or not human beings are hive creatures in just the same way wasps and termites and the social insects are. And this notion about human beings just being selfish doesn't work in evolution. So that's going on there. Um, in psychiatry, uh, the, president, the new president of the American Psychiatric Association's presidential theme is positive psychiatry. Uh, in film, um, it turns out there are powerful executive producers in Hollywood who are asking, why aren't we producing such crap? Uh, uh, could we produce movies that raise the perma of uh, the people who go to those movies. Um, and in education, uh, uh, as I mentioned about Simon Murray and Pisa, um, positive education is, is spreading rapidly around the globe. Now the reason I mention all of this, and, and finally, uh, there are quite a number of people who believe at the heart of positive psychology is the notion of imagination and creativity. And I'll be talking about that on March 7th at some length. Now, the reason I want to stress all that is there is a tsunami of interest going around the world. Imagine that Adelaide became the world capital of well-being. No one else has seized it yet. Adelaide has a great edge. We've lived here two months, so we've seen very little, but this is a wonderful place to live. We've lived all over the world. We love South Australia, and statistically I believe it is one of the most livable cities in the world. In addition, through your thinker in residence program, through the schools, um, all of South Australia is investing in the measurement of well-being and the building of well-being. So indeed, this gives Adelaide an edge. And so my notion is, will Adelaide create, well, let me just back up a bit. Some people say about Adelaide, it's boring. We haven't found it so. Uh, your Lord Mayor said to me, Adelaide's the one great city in the world that nothing really bad has ever happened to. Uh, that may be true. Uh, and I think what's being suggested, what I'm trying to suggest here, is over and above that, uh, Adelaide can do something unique in the world. It has the edge to be the world capital. It can create a well-being institute whose job is to envision and execute the Australian agenda for well-being, the measurement and building of it. Um, it can gather the great international figures in these 10 fields I've talked about to come to Adelaide, uh, both publicly and privately, to work with the Institute. It can become uh, the leader in research on well-being. It can give awards for well-being. And I want to conclude by suggesting that if the world is turning, if there is a tsunami of well-being, if human beings can now hope for more than just not to suffer, then we need a World Well-Being Council, and indeed, Adelaide is the place to found that. Thank you.
That was lovely. Thank you. Can I have some more clapping for Martin Seligman? Thank you. And that's called a hyperma response. Uh, we have about 15 minutes in which we can take probably no more than about six questions. Martin's asked that we do that down here. So, Martin, if you'd like to come and join me down these stairs, um, and if um, I'm not, uh, we, we'll have everyone come up to the microphone. As I say, we're only going to get about six questions in, so I don't think it's worth 20 people lining up. Uh, following these six questions, we'll ask um, Raymond Spencer to come and say thank you and farewell for the evening. Thank you very much, Martin, for that certainly an inspiring um, address tonight. The question I want to ask, and I think you've given me the answer in your speech, is about in the well-being that you've inspired in Mount Barker and how will that be integrated right across our region and right across our state. That well-being is so important for our young people to be taught so they can teach us older residents. How do you see that happening? Um, well, the answer really, Annie, is I don't know. As I essentially have a theory of well-being. I work with individuals about well-being, but I, I think the reason I'm thinker in residence and the reason I'm giving this talk is the question that you have to make it happen, that uh, so many of you are leaders of your community, and the question is once you start measuring it, how can you bring about the institutions, the teaching, the learning that increase it? So, Annie, I, have to th I think the question resides in the mayors, the parents, the teachers. Uh, the best I can do, I think, is to name what should be built, to give you a few measures and some hints, but the building of well-being is local. Oh, hello, Martin. My name is Pam Ronan. I'm the principal of St Francis de Sales College, also at Mount Barker. But I spent the whole of today uh, in a regional planning forum of educators, health workers, local government, where we were looking at supporting the wellbeing of youth right across the Adelaide Hills. And I was really interested in your notion both of the tsunami of wellbeing, but also the invisible hand, because I thought we got tripped up a bit on the scalability of how you measure well-being across a whole region with uh, local councils and schools and health professionals all working together. So I guess my question was around some of your intelligence around the scalability of such measurements, particularly from a regional level as a starting point. Well, I have two things to say about sustainability. Um, the first is that when the principal or the head of a corporation or the premier or the wife says, the job in this marriage is more well-being, the job in this corporation is more PERMA, the job in this school is more PERMA in the students and in the faculty, and I'm going to measure it, then people find ways of doing it and they sustain it. It's essentially the Adam Smith argument about money. It says that the quality of goods and services is uh, supported by when you name that money is the, the bottom line and high quality produces more money in competition, quality increases. PERMA is exactly the same kind of thing. Once you say this is the bottom line, we're going to measure it and we're going to reward the people the marriage, the students, the teachers who do better, it increases. So that's the first thing to be said about sustainability. The second thing is the dirty little secret of psychotherapy. So I, I've spent most of my life being a psychotherapist. And uh, in psychotherapy, you're working on people's weaknesses. And uh, the dirty little secret is well, from the first day I took up skiing to five years later when I quit. I, w I was always fighting the mountain. And that's what you're doing in psychotherapy. You're working on people's weaknesses. 
And the dirty little secret is the way we measure the success of psychotherapy is how long do the skills last at the end of therapy before they melt to zero. So it turns out that when you work on people's weaknesses, people backslide, and within a few months or a year or two, they are statistically, for the most part, back where they were. That's why I mentioned the dieting example. The very interesting thing about positive interventions, they're sustainable. So uh, one, about 10 years ago, we began to uh, have people write down before they went to sleep at night three things that went well and why they went well. And uh, uh, we found not only when, when you did this six months later, people were less depressed and more happier, but it was addicting. And that's because it turns out, unlike turning down chocolate mousse and dieting, it's fun to think about what went well as you go to sleep at night, rather than thinking about uh, what went wrong in your fight with the dean. So it turns out the distinction between psychotherapeutic skills and positive psychology skills is that they're self-sustaining. So you really have two things going for you, the invisible hand of measurement and that when you think of ways, if I say to you, uh, Francine, your, your highest strength is kindness. Why don't you use that more at school? Once you start doing that, people like you better. It's more fun. So these are self, these are sustainable skills. Would you like to come forward? Please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, Martin. My name is Dan Ryan, and I'm uh, the 2012 United Nations Youth Representative for Australia, and also from Adelaide. Um, in my speech to the General Assembly, I, I focused on social media and also on social innovation. And you referred to using social media as a measurement tool. Um, I saw a big theme of cyberbullying coming up, and, and I wondered what your thoughts are on the effect of social media on youth well-being. Um, well, I've been mostly concerned with using the social media as a measurement tool. And it's clear that the social media are having huge effects on our young people, and it's very. I, I found myself keynoting uh, a group of 400 game developers who were all creating uh, pro-social games. So there's a large group of game developers who are creating not shoot 'em up games, but ending world famine games and the like. Uh, and uh, when I look at games like Minecraft that my nine-year-old daughter Jenny is addicted to, it's clear that within the gaming industry, people are finding it profitable and philanthropic to be creating positive psychology games. There are perma games on the market now. So Jane McGonigal has created something called Super Better, which essentially is for depressed people by and large, measures and builds uh, perma, and you do it competitively. Uh, so that's about as far as I can go with it. Uh, thank you very much, first of all. My name's Josie McLean. I work in organisations in leadership development, and I use much of your work, um, so thank you again. Um, but it seems to me, as we work with people in organisations, that um, are we teaching them something new or liberating something that they already know? And I wonder if PERMA is something, actually, that children know very, very well, and that somehow institutions have... Um, Help to uh, help to promote ideas other than that, which we know very well. Does that make yeah, sense? It, I'm interested it, in your it, thoughts. It does indeed, and it's become acute for me. As I said, we've um, I teach courses on leadership occasionally, and with our 13,000 drill sergeants, I think it's very much a leadership issue. So let, let me say what I think is new in leadership. First, I'm very skeptical of the notion of leadership. And that's because I think it's inhomogeneous. And by that, I mean that the people I know who are presidents of university are not interchangeable with the generals I know, who are not interchangeable with the, the politicians I know, who are not interchangeable with the corporate heads I know. 
So I think leadership is highly domain-specific, but followership is not. Followership, for me, consists of being a leader is to create in your followers perma. And the more perma you create, the better a leader you are. So I think we've had leadership backwards. We've been trying to tell leaders what to do, and I think what's new is I'm saying forget what to do. Measure perma in the followers, and then you'll find out who the good leaders are, and then you'll find out what they're doing. Oh, Baden, hello. <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> Uh, Baden Teague, and I'm a, a member of the council at St. Peter's College. Thank you for your excellent address. My question is about changing how governments can work to make well-being uh, in, you know, put it in place. Part of the answer might be the, the institute, but so much of our limited budgets are addressing problems. <laughs> And the public are used to a dialogue or a debate between politicians about problems. Elect us, we'll fix this. So what clues can you suggest um, to me, to us, as to how to change the agenda, how to make it positive? Well, I, w I wish I knew. It's part of the reason I'm in South Australia. It's part of the reason I've, it's been such a privilege to get to know Jay Weatherall in fact. Uh, uh, this is the dream that there will be politicians, I think David Cameron is an example, who have been courageous enough in the middle of a huge austerity program to say the success or failure of my government will not be judged just by GDP, just by the increase or decrease of wealth, but the effect of our policies on well-being. I think that cr takes a lot of courage. My belief is that the world is turning, and particularly as uh, we complement the goals of relieving suffering with the goals of increasing well-being, that visionary politicians will run on this. By the way, I also believe that victimology has run its course, that when the world was a veil of tears, then it made a huge amount of sense that all of our politics should be about the relief of suffering. But as suffering statistically has decreased, and I think you have to be blinded by ideology not to see that over the last 150 years uh, there has been a marked decrease in violence, uh, an increase in human rights, the age of the dictator is coming to an end, uh, we defeated fascism and communism together in the last century. We created universal medical care and universal education. Those are the things we could say no to politically, the wrongs. But there are things that every human being can say yes to. And that's well-being. And I believe it's a viable political agenda. And I hope that some of, some of those of you young people who do politics will be lead the politics of human well-being. Thank you. Well, we have time perhaps for one more, maybe two, but we'll have to be quick. Um, hi, my name's oh, Jamie Lee. I'm a counselling psychologist. I work with children and their families. I'm just wondering about the, the big gap in um, mental and physical health outcomes for Aboriginal kids. Is there anything unique that we'll need to consider when we come to measure the well-being of Aboriginal kids and to imp implement some PERMA strategies to improve their well-being? Well, it's, it's such an important question and I really don't know the answer. And you know, I've had almost no experience with the Aboriginal population of Australia. The one distant thing I can say is that more than half of our work in schools in the United States is with the poorest, most deprived black and Hispanic schools. And this is a far cry from uh, 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 Aboriginal uh, situation. But we're finding at least as good effects on academic performance and on well-being in our poorest communities as in our wealthy communities. So it's a hint, but beyond that, I don't know.
Can I just add that a number of uh, leaders in this space are coming together late next week as part of the residency to discuss this. Um, next question. Last question, I think. Sorry. Hi, my name is Anna Jevons. I'm, I'm just a student who's inspired by all this. I was just wondering if you, you've talked a lot about young people as and children as receivers of the benefits of PERMA and everything. And I was wondering what young people or children can do to promote it and to promote the idea of South Australia as a hub of well-being. Well, I think this is a very important question to end on. Um, I don't have a very kind opinion of the nanny state or of people who impose things on other people. I'm not part of the happiness police. Uh, <laughs> Rather, what the entire literature on well-being shows is that if it's imposed on you, it doesn't work very well. But if you discover it and do it yourself, that is, if you're given the opportunities to create PERMA, then its effects are much larger. So I think what we're really after in government, in schools, in parenting, is the creations of opportunities for individuals to create their own enhanced well-being. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I ask you to come up to the stage? Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. I'm sorry about that last questioner. May I introduce Mr. Raymond Spencer, the Chairman of the Economic Development Board and the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, to make some closing remarks. Thank you. Well, Martin, thank you for such an inspiring and thought-provoking discussion. And, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here this evening. The size of the attendance at tonight's lecture is truly a testament to Martin's vision. And I also wish to uh, personally acknowledge Gabe and her team and recognize the excellent work that they have done during Martin's residency. So please join me in a show of appreciation. As Gabe said, I'm here tonight in my joint capacity as Chair of the Economic Development Board and Chair of the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute. And as we have heard, increasingly we recognize that economic development is built on and indeed serves as its ultimate objective, the well-being and happiness of the community. It's obviously an idea we all heartily embrace. South Australia is a rare place in that it provides comfort to many. It has an abundance of natural resources of both pleasure and productivity. And it has a unique opportunity to create an innovative, productive, and uh, creative economy by virtue of its relative prosperity and mix of industries. Certainly one of the key principles in my life is that we should listen to our hearts. I've personally learned to use enthusiasm as a personal benchmark for the worth of a role or an act. And I think our collective opportunity for prosperity is linked intimately to our individual need for positive emotion and a sense of purpose. And I think we've seen through this lecture tonight and the great work that Martin has done uh, during his residency that the science of well-being has much to teach us about how we can make more productive, innovative, creative organizations by focusing on people. And don't we all deserve to feel that we are accomplishing something that's real and tangible in our lives, not just for ourselves, but for our families, our colleagues, and our communities? it would just seem to make common sense. Martin has challenged us as people of South Australia to be a global demonstration of well-being through a number of initiatives, including, of course, the measurement and strengthening of well-being of all young people in South Australia, making South Australia a hub for the teaching and learning of positive psychology, and the establishment of a world-leading 
Research and Retreat Center. Certainly my colleagues in the Economic Development Board and the SAMRI are very excited by this vision. And I must say, I've been absolutely overawed by the support this has received across all sectors of South Australian society, from the universities, the private sector, business leaders, social agencies, and across the political spectrum. So why is this so important? Well, I think it can contribute mightily to the resilience and positive mental health of individuals, increase the well-being of families in our communities, and it can improve the innovation, productivity, and creativity of our businesses, and truly position South Australia literally uniquely in the world today as a global state of well-being. Martin, thank you for this very, very bold challenge. <laughs> and to each of you, I invite you to work together to turn this challenge and this vision into the reality of the new South Australia. Thank you and good night. Thank you, everyone. That brings our evening to a conclusion. Thank you for being with us.